Hi everyone, it's Miranda Love here with Cougar Mountain Software. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the first of three webinars in Cougar Mountain Software's series on fraud prevention for nonprofits featuring forensic accountant Denise McClure. We're excited to have Denise with us today. She has 35 years of experience in public accounting, business management, and nonprofit board involvement, and is a certified public accountant certified fraud examiner who focuses on reducing risk by creating checks and balances in financial processes and teaching business owners, board of directors, and employees how to achieve transparency and accountability. Today's topic is focusing on responsibilities of board members and managing the risk of fraud. Our next webinar in this series is scheduled for February 21st, where Denise will go into more details on fraud deterrence for board members, executive directors, and staff. And the third webinar with Denise is scheduled for March 7th, where she'll talk to us about the culture of integrity and the foundation for building accountable and transparent organizations. At the end of Denise's presentation, she'll be answering your questions. So feel free to go ahead and type those into the chat box, and we'll get to those at the end. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our featured presenter today, Denise McClure. Welcome, Denise. Thank you, Miranda. As Miranda said, I am a CPA and certified fraud examiner. The shorthand for that is that I'm a forensic accountant. I've been in, in nonprofit uh, work and business management and public accounting for my 35-year career. I started Averti about eight or nine years ago, and I named my company Averti because it means aware in French. And I started Averti Solutions to increase awareness of the risk of fraud and embezzlement in small and medium-sized organizations. Nonprofits are particularly vulnerable to fraud and abuse. They're mission-driven. They generally exist in a very trusting environment. They have tight staffing models and a large volunteer workforce. And they often pay lower wages than the private sector. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners performs a survey every two years, and in it they ask us, the certified fraud examiners, to estimate how much revenue is lost to fraud each year. And for the past several surveys, the number has been 5%. I don't know any nonprofit that couldn't use an extra 5% or that might be forced to trim services if they lost 5% of revenue, especially if that was 5% year over year. In the last ACIP survey, which was published in 2016, nonprofits were victims in 10% of the 2,410 cases, and the median loss was about $100,000. That's a lot of money to lose. You can never, ever reduce your risk to zero. If somebody really wants to steal from you, they're going to find a way to try. But if you build a culture of accountability, transparency, and integrity, it will help you prevent it in some cases, deter it in other cases, and when those two fail, Hopefully, you can detect it very quickly. We have a fairly long agenda today, so I'm not going to read this to you, but we're primarily focusing on issues that are relevant to board members, and you see those listed on your screen there. First of all, what are the legal responsibilities of board members? Now, I'm not an attorney, and I'm not going to give you legal advice. But most of the literature I have seen that have been published by state attorney general's offices and um, several of the organizations that support nonprofits highlight a duty of care, a duty of loyalty, and a duty of obedience. A duty of care, which is what I consider competence, uh, means that a board member must use the same care that an ordinarily prudent person would exercise in a like position and in similar circumstances. So basically, you have to act with common sense and informed judgment. You actively participate in board meetings, attending board meetings, and preparing for them. You're informed and make relevant and reasonable inquiries concerning any issues that are facing your nonprofit. And you must be responsive. So if you do notice that there are warning signs or reports of um, officer or employee theft or mismanagement, malfeasance, misuse of funds, anything like that, then your responsibility is investigate and respond to those reports. The second is a duty of loyalty. I also call that commitment. It's the commitment a board member makes to the organization, and it should be an undivided allegiance, which means no conflicts of interest. You cannot use information obtained through your board involvement for any type of personal gain, and you must maintain confidentiality of any information you receive. Most boards that I have been involved with have a written conflict of interest policy, and they annually ask their board members to prepare a disclosure statement to make sure that everybody is in compliance with that and make sure that there is transparency in that. 
So after competence and commitments, there's compliance or the duty of obedience. Board members must keep an organization focused on its mission and make sure that it's in compliance with its own order, own uh, bylaws and articles of incorporation, its own policies and procedures, and with state and federal laws. And this is where proper financial controls comes in. Board members have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure an organization has current and accurate, valid and reliable records, that they're safeguarding assets, monitoring performance, assuring donations are used for the mission of the organization. So if you want more information on that, check with your state attorney general website because they may have additional information that is relevant for you in your state. Now we get to internal controls, all important. Internal controls, some people think they're just about preventing fraud, but internal controls are not just about fraud prevention. Fraud is the worst case scenario in most cases and it can damage an organization's reputation and the ability to achieve its mission. So if you can protect your company from fraud or protect your organization from fraud, generally you're going to achieve a lot of other things as well, um, in addition to safeguarding company assets. You'll protect your employees, your donors, and your beneficiaries, and that will become clear when we talk about the fraud triangle in the next slide. You'll also be able to identify honest errors and dishonest acts, and the key is, is that you want to be able to identify these in the normal course of operations. It shouldn't be special things that are done, like having an external audit come in or having an internal control assessment. Those are important things to, to do, but they're not really part of your routine inner control process. Finally, internal controls will assure that you have valid, reliable, and timely financial reporting. Controls are not about mistrust. They're really about a board's financial stewardship. They're a way to balance efficiency and security and to create an environment that protects everyone. It protects your staff, it protects your donors, your beneficiaries, and fellow board members. So again, fraud is the worst case scenario. If you can protect the organization from fraud, you'll also be able to achieve these other goals of internal controls. The fraud triangle was developed in the 1940s by a criminologist named Donald Cressy, and it has stood the test of time. Dr. Cressy was interested in people who committed embezzlement, but he wasn't interested in the people who took a position with the intent to steal. He focused on what he termed were trust violators. And he interviewed about 200 people who were in prison for embezzlement, but they were the people who were widely considered to be trusted and honest, and for some reason, they crossed that moral and ethical line and chose to embezzle from their organization. And he determined that there are three elements necessary for someone to commit fraud or embezzlement. The first is financial pressure. It's not just any kind of financial pressure. This is the financial pressure that the would-be perpetrator does not want anyone else to know about. It's a non-shareable financial pressure. So if I was under some sort of financial pressure, but if I had someone I could go to to help me out, I'm not inclined to embezzle. But if I don't have anyone I can go to because I don't want anyone to know about it, then I may be on the path to embezzlement. The second element is opportunity, and that is a perception in the mind of the would-be offender that they can solve their financial problem with your organization's assets. If those two exist, the rationalization is easy. Most fraudsters tell themselves, I'm just borrowing the money. I'm just borrowing it and I'll pay it back as soon as things turn around, or as soon as this happens, or as soon as that happens. Of course, that time never comes, but that's what they tell themselves and they convince themselves. The second most common rationalization is more of a sense of entitlement, that life isn't fair and I deserve this, and by golly, I've had a tough life, so someone else needs to take the pressure off me for this. So that fraud triangle has stood the test of time. Perpetrators tend to be long-term trusted employees with access to money and sometimes the ability to override internal controls. They often act alone, and over 90% are first-time offenders. They can steal because they're trusted and competent. And because they're trusted and competent, they've risen to a level in their organizations where they have access to assets and typically have less oversight. And this is what gives them opportunity. You do not know what's going on in the hearts and minds of your employees and volunteers. Good internal controls keep good people from making bad decisions. 
Let me share with you a case of a, a uh, nonprofit alcoholism and treatment center. They have two to three locations across the state. Their funding sources were primarily the state. And this organization happened to be a perfect storm for fraud. This is what happens when there are absolutely no internal controls. The CEO had been there for about 30 years. He was trained in counseling, clinical supervision, and management. He had absolutely no financial training. And he was also undergoing treatments for throat cancer. So he was a little distracted and wasn't around the organization as much as he normally was. But he implicitly trusted his 18-year office manager. She was a little overwhelmed by her work the last few years, so she, got her, she uh, hired her daughter to help her out. And between the two of them, they stole one and a half million dollars over about four years. They used really simple schemes like cutting checks to themselves and to family members, buying personal items and charging it to the organization's credit cards, and paying off their personal credit cards with the organization's funds. These two women controlled incoming mail, all the accounting records, all the correspondence with the accounting firm, and everything related to vendor payments and payroll. They hid it by failing to make payroll tax payments to the IRS. They destroyed IRS notices. They created bogus financial statements using the logo of an accounting firm and withheld vendor payments. But eventually they couldn't hide it any longer and they were caught. One is in prison and the other is in, on probation. So this is an example of what can happen when you have absolutely no internal controls. And I'm imagining that everybody listening here today would never be caught in this scenario. However, this happens a lot and it is particularly common in nonprofits. So if you don't remember anything else today, remember this, trust but verify. This principle embodies accountability and transparency. It's not about mistrust, it's about holding people accountable for what they do in your organization and making sure that your organization achieves its mission. You want to trust your employees, but you also need to verify that they're doing the right things in the right ways at the right time. And that's accountability. So how can you put this into place? I can give you some tips now about how you might do that. A system of internal control really consists of three components. Creating a culture of integrity, which is really a commitment to accountability and transparency. And we have a whole webinar that we're going to do on that topic. So I'll move on now to segregation of duties. You want to make sure that no one controls a transaction from beginning to end. The office manager and her, her daughter, in the case I just spoke about, they controlled all the transactions from beginning to end. And you saw where that ended up. Um, finally, you need to provide oversight. And when we were talking about the fraud triangle, remember that that perception of opportunity was really a perception in the offender's mind that they could solve their problem with your organization's funds. So you want to battle that with a perception of detection or counterbalance that with a perception of detection. So by providing oversight and providing it in the right ways, you can create a perception that will counter that perception of opportunity. So they won't see that it's such, going to be such an easy route to solve their financial problem with your uh, organization's fund. So it's a balancing act. Every organization is different and how you implement the controls is dependent on how many people you have in the accounting department, how many, um, what kind of accounting system you have, and uh, the skills and abilities of all of your employees. So let's talk about some specifics now of how you can segregate duties and provide oversight. Oversight is really important regardless of the size of your organization. There are always people who are in a position where they can override internal controls or where maybe you have a one-person shop where uh, there's one person who does basically everything. And in that case, oversight and monitoring are very, very critical. And my number one recommendation is to make sure that someone reviews bank statements and credit card statements. This can be the treasurer of the board. It can be an external CPA. Um, it can be someone, whoever it is, it should be someone who is familiar with accounting processes and supporting documentation and can give a critical look to bank statements and credit card statements. Designate someone as the reviewer and whoever that person is, it's really convenient to just have duplicate copies of these statements sent to them at their home. They can review the statements and then request support for a random sample of transactions or 
maybe transactions that they feel are based on the potential for abuse. So you want to look for transactions that seem out of place, things like frequent fuel charges, transfers to unknown accounts, credit card payments you didn't know you have, and things like that. And also verify that payroll withholdings are remitted timely. You can use your accounting system to enforce whatever segregation of duties you have set up by giving people user rights to only what they need to do their job and no more. I wish I had $10 for every time I did an internal control assessment and I was told, yeah, Susie Q, she can, she can probably do that. She probably has rights to do it in the accounting system, but I know her and she would never do that. That is a risk that I would not be willing to take in an organization. You need to set up your user rights and set up your user profiles if your accounting system is capable of that. You need to set up user profiles so that they mirror the employee's job duties and no more. Audit trail reports are special reports that almost all um, accounting systems have, and they tell you who changed what when. And some entry-level accounting products, like some of the QuickBooks products and the Sage products, these audit trails are extremely important because it's possible in those systems to change the name of a payee after you've printed a check. So I can print a check to myself, and then I can immediately go into the accounting system and change it to you know, office supplies or legal or accounting services or wherever I think it will be well hidden. And then no one will be the wiser unless somebody happens to see on the bank statement that I have written a check to myself that's outside of the normal payroll process. So these are important tools, and anybody who provides oversight should have access to an audit trail report. You, you should note you should note that um, anyone who has access to the audit trail report, you should know that it is for transactions only, and any changes to master file accounts of any kind will not be reflected in the audit trail report. So we have to have a different set of controls for master files. Now, master files are basically collections of records in an accounting system. So let me give you some examples probably explain it better than anything else. Um, there's a payroll master file that includes employee names, employee addresses, the bank account for direct deposit, pay rates, um, addresses, uh, phone numbers, um, benefit eligibility, all of that kind of information is in a master file and that's separate from the transactions uh, files that you use to process payroll. Um, vendor files have names and addresses and contact information for vendors. Donor master files include donation amounts, names, addresses, phone, event attendance, giving profiles, and things like that. So all those separate master files, you want to control access to those. If you can control access so the person, for example, the person who processes payroll is different than the person who can change pay rates and input bonuses and change the direct deposit bank account, that's the best of all worlds. But sometimes if you can't control access to it because you don't have enough people in your accounting system and it would just be too cumbersome and inefficient, Make sure that you have an accounting system that will provide you with an edit list of any changes that are made to the master file. On reporting, you want to make sure that you are looking at trending reports at the board level. Um, that there should be flexibility in your accounting system with designing reports because that is critical to managing an organization and for board members to fulfill their fiduciary, fiduciary responsibilities. So you want to make sure that you have trending reports. You want to make sure that you're looking at comparative financial statements and you're looking at budget actual comparisons as well as prior period comparisons and prior year comparisons. And you want to be able to have some flexibility so that you know, whatever issue comes up, if you're closely monitoring restricted funds and comparing it to your cash balance or any other type of uh, financial issue that you are monitoring, that it is easy to create reports that you can use um, for that function. And finally, most account, most uh, nonprofits work on, um, manage their books based on fund accounting, and so you want to make sure that you have good functionality for fund accounting. All uh, your accounting staff will really thank you for that. So these are all um, types of internal controls that help build a culture of integrity as a perception of detection. Segregating duties is just another way of building an oversight. Um, and you need both kinds of tools to build a strong, efficient system of checks and balances. These are some of the red flags that you should be aware of. Um, lavish lifestyle, 
financial problems. Again, if somebody considers their financial problem non-shareable, they might not share that with you. But divorce and family issues and maybe a sense of entitlement. Um, the next two, if reports are not done timely, despite the fact that somebody's working excessively long hours, that's a significant red flag and you should be aware that you should look into that. If an individual who is responsible for creating the port reports never takes vacation, shows defensive behavior or controlling attitude and refuses to delegate to anyone, that is another huge red flag because that is the number one concealment strategy. So if you see those kinds of behaviors, these are in no way indicative that somebody is committing fraud, but they would warrant and be a signal that you need to take a closer look. A check ambush is simply when somebody, when an individual is responsible for signing checks and maybe they have to leave somewhere and everybody knows they have a noon deadline. Somebody walks in their office at 11.58 and says, oh, you have to sign all these checks right now. And they get ambushed into signing them quickly without looking at any of the support documentation. So don't fall prey to that. And again, these are warning signs and red flags, but they are not indicative that somebody is actually stealing. If you suspect something's going on or if you see some of those red flags, the first um, the first thing people want to do is confront the individual that they think is responsible. And that is probably one of the worst things you can do. The first thing you need to do is determine if this is an intentional problem, an intentional ongoing issue, or whether it's simply human error. Once you determine that maybe it's not an error and you find some evidence of that, you want to make sure that you preserve evidence that you consult your attorney because you want to avoid a wrongful termination charge or you want to know how best to proceed. You need to review your fraud policy, which I'm sure all of you have or could easily develop with all the good examples that exist on the website. You want to make sure that you recover assets. You need to find out what kind of employee dishonesty coverage you have, which is usually part of your package of um, property and liability coverage. By the way, that is something that would be a good thing to review because you would want to make sure that you have the coverage limits in place that you need to have in place. Finally, you would want to seek justice and you would want to define the communication channels. If you do seek justice and there is some negative publicity associated with this, there are ways to turn that into positive publicity by the way you communicate it to the media and the public. So you want to herald the fact that you um, are an organization of integrity and that you have uh, good controls in place and that sometimes when people take advantage of that, uh, that you are going to hold them accountable for their actions. And so you want to limit who does the communication and how they communicate and develop some talking points for that. If you have a member of the media who is on your board, they can often help with that as well. So be proactive. Um, develop a fraud policy before you need it. Uh, conduct any kind of a preliminary investigation and don't confront the individual as a first step. So again, if you don't remember anything else, remember the trust but verify principle. This embodies accountability and transparency. It's not about mistrust, it's about holding your people accountable. You saw what happened when there's too much trust and no oversight when we talked about the mother-daughter team. You don't know what's going on in the hearts and lives of your employees. You don't know their state of mind, you don't know if they're depressed, if they have an online gambling addiction, if they're going through a divorce, or any other financial problem they might have. So protect your organization and your employees by developing a culture of integrity based on accountable and transparent business practices. Thank you, Denise. Cougar Mountain Software believes your accounting system has an obligation to provide basic internal controls. Always look for in-depth user rights that encourage differentiated roles, a tamper-proof audit trail, as well as customizable reports to support transparency, education, and awareness. Cougar Mountain Software's Denali Fund Accounting Solution is specifically tailored for nonprofits and offers all of the above features. Fraud is unpredictable, but protecting your organization doesn't have to be. For a comprehensive demo, go to www.cougarmtn.com and request a demo or call 1-800-388-3038 to see how Denali Fund can help your nonprofit. We will open it now up for questions for Denise. Um, Denise, do you have any recommendations on how or when uh, we should make changes just to internal controls and minimize the type of resistance? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, right. One of the um, 
best times to implement changes to your internal control system is when you are naturally or organically going through some other changes as well. So if you're adding or reducing your workforce or your department, if you are implementing a new accounting system or upgrading your accounting system, um, if you obtain a new, uh, new grant that maybe has some uh, criteria for how you report to them, um, if someone in your office is preparing for maternity leave, if you're getting a new office manager or executive director, all these are great times to just build the changes involving internal controls into other changes that are going on. If none of those changes are going on in your organization, another opportunity is to, you know, simply blame it on your CPA, blame it on a banker if you're looking to refinance your building or um, obtain a line of credit or something like that. Say that the bankers require it and or the insurance company requires it for um, your new property liability coverage or the accountants are requiring it because when they come in to do the audit they want to be able to rely on your internal controls. We accountants have very broad shoulders and so you can blame it on us and that won't be a problem at all. We're happy to take that on. Thank you, Denise. I've got another question here. Uh, can you use the same principles for profit organizations as you kind of shared today for nonprofit organizations? Absolutely. All of the criteria, all of the internal control ideas that I've shared with you today are applicable to nonprofits and they're applicable to the private sector as well as to the public sector like government uh, institutions as well. Um, internal controls are important in any type of a, a business and nonprofit environment and the principles that I discuss here are perfect for any of those types of environments. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, maybe we lost audio, but hopefully, hopefully y'all can hear me. Um, so another question that came through, uh, you mentioned that we can turn a negative publicity into something positive. How, how would we go about doing that? Well, I think that any media attention can be turned into good media attention, even if it's about something negative like embezzlement. And again, it's all in how you communicate. And let me repeat the question because I think our audio just came back. Um, I mentioned in my presentation that uh, we can turn negative publicity into something more positive and a caller asked me to elaborate on that. Any media attention can be positive media attention for your organization even if it is about a negative incident um, that could damage your reputation if you're silent about it. So you need to put a communication package together and talk about how um, one person in your organization did something wrong and because you are an organization of integrity and financial responsibility you plan to hold that person accountable and that you're going to be adjusting your internal controls to make sure that any um, weaknesses are um, reversed and turned into strengths and that you are undergoing um, changes in your organization to make sure that all the beneficiaries of your mission are going to be able to um, receive the benefits that they so richly deserve. So again, anything like this that is negative publicity can actually be turned around and made into positive publicity if you frame it properly. Thank you so much, Denise. If we don't have any other questions coming through right now, we'll go ahead and wrap it up to keep to our 30 minutes of uh, fraud deterrent uh, for board members. And I want to thank everybody for attending. And if you will check your email, we will be sending out a replay link if you'd like to share this with anybody. And also, you'll get a copy of Denise's slides that she used for the presentation. So make sure to check your email for this and for uh, notifications for our upcoming webinars. Thank you so much to everybody for attending. And, and a special thank you to Denise McClure, our feature presenter today. Thank you so much. <laughs>